What's going on guys, this is Chris with Cowdog and today I'm gonna to be showing you how to build the Nicholson workbench. It's quite a doozy, but stick around and check it out. The story of this workbench starts with the lumber. The Nicholson workbench is an English carpenter's bench that begs to be made of construction grade material like this southern yellow pine. I encourage everyone to read Christopher Schwartz's blue book on workbenches which I've linked in the comments below. It's got plans for this bench and more and has a lot of the history and mechanics behind those classic woodworking benches. I'm using 16 foot boards because those tend to be the clearest and the driest of the bunch and then I break them down into manageable yet oversized chunks pursuant to the cut list in the book. Since these are construction grade boards, I stickered and stacked them to let them get to equilibrium before running them through the thickness planer to get them just a hair above the final thickness. And these trips through the planer allow me the opportunity to hand plane everything down to finish without going below the desired thickness that I'm looking for. After those initial passes, I'm going to straight line rip one side on the table saw with the taper jig. And then I'm going to run the opposing face through the planer. And then lastly, I'm gonna rip that final edge. The legs are angled in at 20 degrees, so I set my miter gauge with the backstop accordingly and then cut the legs down to size. The legs each consist of two boards that are then glued together in an additive joinery fashion. Before I glue up, I'll hit them with the hand plane to make sure the mating surfaces are dead flat. You might also note the shakiness in the old bench here, and that's a lot of the reasoning behind building a new one. The glue up consists of a piece that is significantly shorter than the other, which creates a lap that the apron will nest into. That apron that is covered in dog holes is one of the signature pieces of the Nicholson, and creates an endless amount of work holding options for the user. Using the dado stack, I'm hogging out the waist on the tenons that will join the legs to their opposing sides. The push paddle is going to make sure the stack is in lifting the workpiece up through the cut. Here I'm chiseling down to my marking line. Using the router plane to clean up the faces of the tenon, and that's also going to help me get the face of the tenon parallel to the reference surface. And you'll notice here while I'm cutting down the tenon that I max out the capacity of my dovetail saw, so I'm finishing the cut with a spineless pull saw. And with that done, I have one set of upper and lower rails to join the legs along their width. These are obviously going to come together with mortise and tenon, so I marked out the mortises and their corresponding tenons using blue tape, and then started hogging out the waste on the drill press. The drill press vise would have been nice here to keep everything in line, but for the most part I was able to do it just by scribing a center line with the marking knife and following it with the brad point of the Forstner. Since there's a lot of drill press here, let me take a minute to thank you folks for checking out the channel in this video. Please hit that like button for me, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for more notifications, comment below, and give me a crisp air 5 through space and time. Every little bit helps to make this channel better with every video. You can also follow me on social media for more daily shenanigans and a lot of snippets for upcoming videos. After all the waste is hogged out, I'm using chisels to clean up the mortises.
For through mortises, I highly recommend marking both the entry and exit points of your mortise and cleaning up halfway and flipping for a sharper result. These are going to be drawboard mortise and tenons, so I'm punching and drilling the entry and exit holes for the dowels first with a brad point bit. Then during a dry fit, I use that same brad point bit to mark the center of the hole on the tenon itself. With a punch, I'm coming in towards the shoulder just a touch to create the offset. These dowels are going to be pretty beefy, so I don't want too much offset, which is going to make pounding them in a little bit difficult. I used mostly store-bought dowels, but I ended up running out, so I whipped up one with the dowel plate. And I'm going to taper one end. Matching the angle of the legs with a bevel gauge, I ripped the top edges of the top and bottom rails to match that corresponding angle. For assembly, I'm using epoxy instead of wood glue to maximize my assembly time. Also, not all my mortise and tenons were perfect, so this operates as a gap filler when necessary. I used a little sawdust to tint the epoxy as well, however that's largely unnecessary because all the joinery ends up being concealed in the final bench. Epoxy was all nice for driving the dowels in because it didn't cause the joint to swell like glue would, so the dowels actually slid in quite nicely. Now onto the aprons which will get planed down to final thickness. And as a side note, don't be scared to pull your planes when you need to. I used the track saw to trim up the ends and then add a little 45 degree detail as well. The 45 degree is purely aesthetic and really has absolutely no function. It just looks dope and that's cool because my life is dope and I do dope stuff. Like sweeping. Then it's time to glue the aprons onto the legs, and you can see that it's about to nest into this little lap that I had mentioned before. I'm using the blue tape and CA glue trick to help clamp the legs upward into the apron. Honestly, this method isn't all that effective and doesn't allow for enough pressure to be applied, so I'd skip it altogether if I had to do it again. Next, I'm going to pre-drill and set some 2-inch screws through the leg into the apron itself to hold everything in place. The screws are probably unnecessary, but benches take so much racking forces that it just makes sense to have a mechanical fastener there. And here I'm just repeating everything on the opposing side. After it comes out of the clamps, I flush the aprons to the tops of the legs with a hand plane. I'm marking where I want my dog holes using a 12 inch speed square. I want dog holes to run vertically but also at a 45 degree angle across the width of the apron. I'm just freehand drilling these with a 3 quarter inch Forstner, but you can use a press guide. For the most part if you keep your eye on the bit though with the Forstner you can get a pretty straight hole. And as you can see the 3 quarter inch dog holes work great with the hold facet they were intended for. Again, matching the angle of the legs, I'm ripping a strip that will be a cleat which attaches the top to the base. 
This cleat will get glued onto the legs and I'm going to set it in place with a combo of CA glue and wood glue. The CA glue holding it in place long enough for the wood glue to fully cure and keep it secure. I'm not doing a wagon vise on this Nicholson like in Schwartz's book, so I'm going to build up some material on the end to accept a record quick release vise. Here I'm using the router to hug out material to accept that and cleaning it up with chisels. The idea here is that I'm going to glue in one board at a time and clamp each board to the next to build a block to accept the vise hardware. This end will also get two right angle brackets, which again help against all the racking forces a bench takes regularly. To fit the vise, I'm going to mark the jaw out and mortise it into one of the boards in the block, once again using a router and chisels to clean everything up. Accommodating for the vice screw proved tricky. Had I to do this again, I would have cut this out ahead of time with the bench unassembled. Also, if you're making a longer bench, you probably won't have this problem at all. But since I'm tiny shop guy, the eight foot Nicholson from the book is actually compressed to five feet. So spade bits, a jigsaw, and a rasp got me to a point where the vice screw can fit the bench and slide effectively. <laughs> Now I'm boring into the block for a through bolt to mount the vise from the bottom. And then there's also some beefy lag screws toward the back of the vise, which is going to ensure that this thing is going nowhere. I'm capping the jaw with a piece of scrap oak and using the brad point bit to mark the center of the holes, pre-drilling and then firing a screw in to fix everything in place. This whole face will ultimately be screwed in instead of glued in in the event the vise ever needs to be changed or removed. For the workbench top, I've ripped a number of different boards for the clearest sections and I'm bringing those together with the domino. Since horizontal alignment isn't really an issue, I'm going to fix the tenons in with the small mortise setting and then use the medium mortise setting for the receiving mortises. This ensures that I have vertical alignment but allows me a little bit of wiggle room left to right while waiting on the glue to cure and through the assembly process. During this process, I actually ran out of this size domino, so I made a couple as well. After it's out of the clamps, it's on to planing to flatten the bottom and then trimming the ends to size. From the underside, I'm attaching the top using two inch screws. After the top is secured, I'm gonna go ahead and work my way through the hand planes until the top is flat. To make sure the hold fast on the top have a little thickness to grab onto, I'm going to double up the material in spots where I'm planning on drilling dog holes. Those will be glued and temporarily mounted with two inch screws before replacing those screws with Miller dowels. I'll actually be replacing all the screws into the top of the workbench with Miller dowels. And as you can see, the bench is already getting pretty weighty. And here I'm just flushing up the workbench top to the apron. If you happen to be watching this video at your day job, I apologize because these curls from my low angle block are absolutely not safe for work.
For my leg vise, I'm modifying a Lee Valley tail vise screw by putting a hand wheel on it. This is entirely unnecessary, but I just like the look. I actually had to take the wheel to a machinist to get the holes bored right, and then had some inventors driving in this roll pin. There's plenty of decent leg vise hardware available out there where you don't need to customize your own. This is some scrap rosewood for the opposing quick release vise jaw and I'm going to mark it similarly as before, drill out the holes and then shape it down with a round over bit in the router. The bolts I had on hand were a little long, so I cut them down with the angle grinder. Threading the nut on first allows for repairing or reshaping damaged threads on the end when unscrewing the nut. So as I said, Miller dowels will be replacing all the screws in the workbench top, and that's because over time I'll want to flatten the top and I don't want to risk nicking a screw with one of my planes. These dowels come with a step drill bit that matches the topography of the dowel itself. You just drill, add glue, set, and trim the excess. The leg vise will also be made from rosewood and I'm bringing these two pieces together with the domino. Once out of the clamps, I'll cut it to match the same angle as the legs, and then I'm going to clamp it to the bench and mark out the vice screw, the top, edges, as well as the parallel guide. I'll use the drill press to drill for the vice screw itself, but I'm going to freehand for the parallel guide, which is going to attach with a wedged mortise and tenon. The mortise is slightly trumpeted on the side opposite the receiving end, so the side that's facing towards you on the bench. So to achieve that, I'll just chisel a little inward at an angle rather than go dead square. And then I'm going to shape the entire leg on the table saw using some huge bevels to just provide some interesting embellishments to the vise itself. The parallel guide is made from ash and I cut the tenon itself on the table saw before drilling holes in the tenon to allow for the wedges to be driven in and flex outward. With some scrap mahogany, I'm freehand cutting some wedges, and then on the drill press, I'm going to drill holes for cross pins in the parallel guide. Then everything gets glue, and the wedges are tapped in, and later flush trimmed and planed.
The vice screw and hand wheel are then mounted to the bench. And then like I did on the aprons, dog holes will be drilled through the top. I'll be freehanding these again, but since my Forstner bit only goes so deep, I'll max it out and then switch over to a spade bit for the last little length. Instead of gasket material to line the vices, I'm going with leather and will use contact cement to apply. A layer on each side, a bit of time to marinate, and then steady placement and pressure and you're all set. Shout out to my man Brian from Rowan and Witch for hooking me up with some scrap leather for this. I've also heard that you can use wood glue to apply leather as well, but the leather guys I've talked to swear by contact cement, so that's what I stuck with in this application. And here I'm just trimming away the excess material so that way it's going to be nice and flush with the top of my vise as well as the bench. I ran some L-shaped stretchers along the bottom rails to start a lower shelf, secured with countersunk screws. Then, to nail the inside measurement for the slats, I'm clamping two pieces of scrap which will give me a measurement to crosscut some tongue and groove boards to. Pre-made tongue and groove is not mentioned in the Schwartz book, but I was eager to wrap this up, so a couple 12-foot boards did the trick. I capped the ends by ripping a fit-to-size tongue strip as well as a fit-to-size groove strip that will go on either end. And after getting it all into place, I just tacked the corners in with a brad nail. For a plane stop, I picked up the Lee Valley Aluminum Adjustable Plane Stop and hogged out the mortise with a chisel. Schwartz mentions these in his book and talks about the unruly bottom shape, which makes these a bit difficult to install. This wasn't the worst, but I would suggest marking it out from the underside and drilling a hole larger than the screw post and working your way back from that. It took a bit of trial and error, but eventually it nestled in quite nicely. I'm not going to get complicated with the finish since this thing is going to get often used and abused, so I'm going with Danish oil and I'm going to use the entire can. Just wipe on and wipe off and all the little crevices that you can get it in. After letting it dry for 24 hours, I got to test out the bench and all its little features. And need I say, I am thrilled with the performance. You can actually clearly see in this video that there's no more bench rock. And I have a ton of different work holding options for pieces of any size. This bench is going to be in the center of the shop and double as table saw outfeed as well. So I'll actually have two functional sides of the bench and a myriad of work holding options without it being pressed against the wall. The vices are strong and secure, and I can't wait to get deeper into hand tool woodworking using all the advantages that this bench provides. This is my first time working with Holdfast as well, and I can definitely understand what all the hype is about. 
Overall, this was a pretty daunting build that forced me to learn a lot along the way. I strongly advocate for everyone to read Christopher Schwartz's book on workbenches and even get the updated red edition for more insight and know-how. The history and the why behind these benches is valuable to the growing woodworker, and at the end of the day, these benches are like lasagna and should be made, not bought. Thanks for watching. If you haven't already, hit that like button, subscribe, comment down below, hit the bell for more notifications. You know the drill. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks.